And it's a time where we get to just relax. Be in your word. Study about you. Love on one another. Fellowship with one another. Read your word together. So, Father, we thank you for this day of rest, this holy festival that's been put aside for all of us. So I just want to thank you. Just want to thank you. Father, if there's anyone here that needs you today, we ask that you touch their soul, their spirit, their heart. Get anything out of the way that doesn't belong here and that only you reside. In thy blessed name, amen. Mitzorah. I find this a fascinating text for a couple of reasons. When I first started to read it, I thought it looked like some sort of pagan ritual. I mean, really. I mean, birds being attached to wood, feathers being dipped into blood. Come on, really? I mean, that didn't look like it was maybe something coming out of the word. And isn't it any wonder, many times you'll run across people and they'll say this to you. Oh, do you belong to a cult? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen that? Ever heard that? And you go, no, I'm just repeating things from the word. You want to read it together? Let's figure this thing out. Because what's amazing about the difference between a cult and a fellowship is that fellowships digest things together, argue, have differences of opinions, love on each other. A cult, you guys just all do what you're supposed to do. And I, I don't think that's ever happened here. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> wow. Praise Yah, right? <laughs> so I, <laughs> I was looking at this thing, right? And we always run into these arguments everywhere we go. Is it law or grace? Is that a lesson or is it a ritual? Okay. Is it a faith or is it a cult? Well, do you, do you know what? I mean, the way, the way the early church was a cult, it followed Yeshua. And I'm glad I follow that particular way. Okay. It's not a bad thing all the time. Then there's the other one that's called testimony or ceremony. Have you ever thought of that? You're going to give your testimony or you're going to keep a ceremony? Okay, you're going to give a testimony. Some of you were giving testimonies today by reading the word from the Psalms. Okay, some of you were going ahead and saying or singing a song. Here's my challenge. Can any of you give a two-minute testimony? Would you be able to walk up to a stranger and give a two-minute two testimony? I met someone in my life. I want you to know about him. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach. He saved me. He's my Messiah. I was a wretched idiot. And then I got to know him. Let me tell you why. You want to hear it? That's what a two-minute testimony is like. Right? I know. That's one minute. Can you give a two-minute testimony? I had the spirit of religiosity myself. I wanted to do everything just right. Came up with my German heritage, my SDA background, all that kind of stuff. If I had to get up and sing a song, and believe me, my wife and I had to get up and sing a lot of songs at a lot of very important places and a lot of very important programs, a lot of very important TV episodes, all that kind of stuff. And guess who was in the bathroom a half hour before? Me. Scared to death. Scared to death, hands sweating, heart beating, because you had this thing, you have to come out and be just right. You have to wear a right tie, a suit, come out, 
sing the song perfectly. And if the song's not perfect, someone's going to know, and they're going to definitely correct you at the end. Yeah. Oh, so you, I see you didn't hit that note very good today. Yeah. Interesting thing, that spirit of religiousity. I got to know the Savior, and he cleaned me up, and he says, you know what, Rollin, make a joyful noise anyways. It doesn't really matter. The other one that comes up a lot is Torah or Paul. Well, why do you have to make a decision? Why do you have to make a decision? I mean, Paul taught Torah, okay? And Torah gave Paul a lot of material. <laughs> I mean, think about that for a minute, all right? Paul wouldn't have had a job if it wasn't for Torah, actually. You know, so I... I, I kind of want to go over some of these, but let me show you why, okay? Because I think this is interesting. I want us to hear each other. I want us to understand each other. And I want us to all to understand that we are poor and we are in need. Every one of us. And some of you may have long testimonies, some of you may have short testimonies. Some, some of you might have a testimony of the Spirit that happened in a second. Some of you might be like Peter who took three years to get a testimony. Did you hear me? And he was an ongoing testimony. I wonder if he could really define when it happened. Was it when he cut the ear off? Was it when he denied the Savior? Was it when he couldn't cast out demons? Was it, one, was it when he had a vision? When did he actually notice it? But some of you might have been like Paul. You got knocked off of a donkey. And the Lord came down and spoke to you and said, get up. Testify for me. Every testimony is different. Every testimony is different. In all my life of teaching Bible classes and ministering and pastoring, I've heard countless different types of testimonies. Some that are as deep as the river goes. Some that are shallow and that are expanding. Some that are just acknowledging and go, wow, I saw a vision for the first time and I want you to know about it. Some of them were saying, I still want a vision. <laughs> I hope the Lord gives me one. You understand what I'm trying to say? So when we look at this, I picked this picture for a reason because many times we want to get argumentative with each other. And we think it's my way or the highway. Is it law or is it grace? Well, if you can't believe it's grace, then you're wrong because you believe in the law. Really? How do you know that the law might not get me to grace? <laughs> How do you know that grace might get me to the law? You don't know. Because the Lord deals with each one of us differently. And that's what happens within this study. I want you to look at the purpose of the Torah, because I look at the Torah differently. And this is part of my personal sharing. Many times some of you have asked me, well, Roland, what do you really believe? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you don't get to know. You no, know, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> The Torah to me is a prophetic series of books that speak to the wisdom and the life of the Messiah. Amen. The Torah to me is a series of books that teach me the prophetic life and the works of the Messiah and how I can walk in that life. That's what the Torah is to me. And I know this from these chapters. These are my personal chapters and verses that I hold dear to my heart. All scripture is inspired by Yahweh and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training, for righteousness. When Paul wrote this to Timothy, when Paul wrote this to Timothy, there was only the Torah and the writings and the prophets. Yeshua only spoke from the Torah and the writings and the prophets. So I know I cannot forget the Torah and the writings and the prophets because they help me. Here's another thing that I believe about the Torah. It's a witness for me. 
I believe my life has been changed through grace and the spirit has entered into my life and has given me the ability to speak honestly with people. As most of you guys know, maybe you didn't know, but as I was growing up through my years, I had the most difficult stuttering problem you could ever imagine. If I were to speak to anyone, I'd go And I had to change my words constantly because I couldn't speak them. The Lord has been able to allow me to speak now on radio on a regular basis. I speak to thousands of people, I sing to thousands of people, and I don't stutter. So is there a Holy Spirit within me? Yes. Yes. Did it take a while? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> the other thing that's so important for me to understand, this is the second text. It comes from Matthew, and this is from Yeshua's own words. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. That law is a witness, and it mirrors my life. Okay, so let me try to break this down. If I live in the Spirit, I have to know that I live in the Spirit. How? Because many times we know our heart's been changed. You can feel the change in your heart. You know what's right or wrong, right? But sometimes you need a witness, a mirror to let you know how's it going. All right? And to me, that's what the Torah does for me. It lets me know how I'm doing. That's about it. So those are my two texts. I'm going to take you down through a couple more. A picture's worth a thousand words. Some people ask, they come in here and they ask you, well, why do you guys believe in that Hebrew stuff? And you guys say a bunch of really strange words. You know? Rather than amen, you go, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than Jesus, you say Yeshua. Okay? Some of you might say it different than that. <laughs> and I know all the different names you have for God are Elohim. And so there's all those different sorts of things. You say Mispaka, and they go, what's Mispaka? Okay, what's Oneg? Is that fellowship? <laughs> Is that potluck? <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I fell in love with Hebrew is because it's a picture language. Okay, so then all the pictures that happen within Torah or the writings or the prophets, they have pictures to them. Okay, I'm attention deficit, so I like pictures. Does that work for you? All right, that's why I like Hebrew. All right, so let's go into this other one. We're into Leviticus, because I told you we get into this, and I just want you to understand this one. This particular one is called the law of the leopard in the day of his cleansing. It's Leviticus 14. It's a law. It's a ceremony. It's a custom. It's a ritual. But is it? But is it? Notice... Everyone here, you've understood Hebrew long enough to know that leprosy, the rabbis at the times thought that you got leprosy because of Lashon Hara, your stupid mouth, okay? It does things that you don't want it to do. Well, besides the Lashon Hara, the person who speaks leprosy, there's the person who hears Lashon Hara. It takes two to dance. That's one of my philosophies in life. Those of you who know me know this well of me. I don't ever believe it's one person's fault, ever. I can say ever pretty good. It always takes two to dance. And the same thing is true with Lashon Hara or the spreading of ill will, bad words, those sorts of things. One to speak it <laughs> and one to listen to it. Oh, tell me, tell me, I wanna know what's wrong with Sally. You know? And we get that little leprosy mark there. You see that on the ear? And so when we're looking at this, we have these little customs that, that come up, and that's called the, the priest is looking over you to find out if you got that little leprosy mark on you. Make sense? 
Now I'm going to put in the words of this text. If you want, you can turn with me to Leviticus 14. All right? And I want to make it real for you in the picture language and also in the language of grace. Because I believe that everything in Torah is a picture of Yeshua or a picture of grace and of mercy. It's not just a custom. It's something that changes our life. So turn with me, and I'm going to fill you in with words or understandings. They're the shortened ones. When you get into Midrash today, you'll be in longer ones. David and I, were we had no idea we were writing on the same thing this week. David did much better on defining everything for you. I wrote a shorter one, and so I'm just going to give you the short one, all right? Believe me, that when I tell you that the understandings I have come from the Strong's Hebrew Concordance, it comes from biblical texts, and it comes from the Jewish um, college and the Jewish learning center of the university there in Israel. But they're short. The priest gives orders. The priest, as you know, in the New Testament is whom? Yeshua HaMashiach. He's our high priest. And we have a high priest who gives some orders. And he says, take two live birds. In the Hebrew context, the pictures of that are little sparrows. And those sparrows can represent both our flesh and our spirit. Amen. The workings of the flesh and the freedom of the spirit to fly. Okay, so we have two sparrows. The cedar wood is strength, roots, and it even takes on the word pride. Cedar wood was many times used to, to open doors or to create doors for temples because it was so strong. It develops its roots into the, into the dirt well. And for human language, it's the area of pride, strength, something that stands up. Pride's not always negative, okay? It's the standing up of pride. The scarlet and the scarlet thread, this is blind dye from a worm, or it's a cry for help. Now, many of you guys understand this, and, and you get it. Yeshua said, for such a worm as, as I, because he died for us. And even on the cross, he cried out, Abba, Father, it is finished. Okay, so remember what I told you before, Torah is a prophetic word of the workings and the life of Yeshua. And we're going to see this within the own, with its own text. Hyssop is a purification herb used as a brush to apply the blood of the very first Passover. Okay? So we're using that hyssop to go on, to purify us. And the one who is to be cleansed is whom? The sinner. You and I. You and I. The priest shall also give orders to slay or to sacrifice for humanity's sin. The reason why sacrifices were given was to cover our iniquities. Okay, so they practiced this. The bird in an earthen-worn vessel. This, you have to understand from the Hebrew point of view that the vessel is a container. And it's an earthen container. All right? The vessel can only take on the contents of what's in it or what its mission is to do. So the vessel itself is either filled up with wonderful food and it's being taken somewhere or it's filled up with water and being taken somewhere, but it represents something that's being filled and taken. The very first earthen vessels were Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, being the first earthen vessel, moved towards iniquity. And we inherited that iniquity according to Psalms 51. Remember, David speaks and says, my mother, from the source of what I was born, I was born into what? Iniquity and sin. And that comes from here. And this needs to be over running water. Who's the living water? Who's the running water? Yeshua. Okay? And the Holy Spirit. We move here to another one. As for the live bird, that's that small bird or sparrow, either your flesh or spirit, he shall take it together with cedar wood, strength, roots, and pride, and the scarlet thread. Now, the scarlet thread is really important. Scarlet thread is weaved through the curtains in the tabernacle. Scarlet thread represents the, the, the sacrifice Yeshua has made for every one of us, and it's webbed or weaved into our lives to rescue us. 
That to me is very important. Even Rahab, when she let the spies over the wall, scarlet thread was in the rope that she let down for them. So even a prostitute understood the meaning of the scarlet thread. You'll, you'll get into this more in your Midrash. And the hyssop shall dip them and the live bird in the blood. What is blood? Life. For life is in the blood. That's in Bereshit, Genesis. Life is in the blood. And that bird was slain over the running water, the Maim, or the living water. He shall then sprinkle it seven times. Seven is what? A completion of something and moving into a new beginning, a new cycle. The one, the sinner who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, that's iniquity, which comes up from where? Our mouth. Because what is inside us comes out. And, they, and the priest shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird go free. That's your spirit into an open field. Now I want you to look at this particular text. If we allow ourselves to take on the sacrifice, if we accept the sacrifice, our spirit gets to be set free. That's what gets to happen to us. And we, that's called living in the spirit. The Lord takes your old man and gets rid of it. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify Yah in your body and in your spirit, which is whom's? Yahweh's. Now I gave you Roland Betts' version, and that's the next one. And this is what I took from my lesson. The Savior takes my old fleshly vessel that I got from Adam and Eve of sin and pride. And he renewed it through his blood, his water, and his purification so that my spirit man can become whole, alive, and well. My old man will be put to death and my new man is set free. So I just told you a little bit about myself. I have to take on this promise daily. Otherwise, I'll forget it and my old man pops back up. Is it possible for your old man to come back up even though you've bl been blessed in the spirit? Yes, and it's proven over and over again by the examples within Scripture. Paul said he wrestled with it every day of his life. Well, if he had received the Spirit, which he did, why does he still have to wrestle? Because we still got to deal with our soul. Got it? Yes, our spirit has been set free, but we still have to wrestle with the soul itself. And that's when we all have a choice. Would you say that Solomon knew the spirit? Yeah, he talked with Yahweh twice. He, he was given the temple to build. Do you think someone could build the temple without being in the spirit? That was questionable. <laughs> could someone build the temple without being in the spirit? I don't think so. He had to be in the spirit. And to receive direct word from the king himself, he had to be in the spirit. So what happened to Solomon? He's the only guy in scripture that says, and Solomon loved foreign women. <laughs> no one else has talked like that. So he had a weakness in his soul. And he had to deal with it. The witness to me is a ceremony. So when we look at this terrible thing, well, supposed thing of the, the bird in the blood and the dipping and tied to a cedar wood, remember Yeshua was tied to a tree and he was dipped in blood, okay? If I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this thing from Leviticus. John, the apostle, gives us a way to test the spirits. Remember when I told you that to me the Torah was my witness, okay? John himself writes in 1 John 4 to test the spirits. If you don't believe in Torah, how can you test the spirit? Because the Torah is the written word of Yah. Okay? So I can test the spirit. Is the spirit that I'm doing right now, is it from him or is it from another spirit? Because remember, Satan's very capable of showing his spirit alive and well in, in, in our bodies. What's amazing to me is Messiah heals us 
And every one of us that's born into iniquity. Now, I want you to look at these things that he healed. And I know this is elementary. I'm, this is so basic, it's ridiculous. But yet it's so deep. Blind. Spiritual blind, blindness. Many times, many of us just kind of go through and we're, we're, we're religious. But we're not open to spirituality. We're religious. Remember some of the patriarchs when it said their eyes grew dim? That's when they were starting to not see the spiritual workings of the spirit, the Ruach. The deaf don't want to hear, don't want to know, ain't going to listen. I've already figured out my own way of looking at the Bible, and it's this way. Deafness. Dumb. I can't speak. No one wants to hear me speak. I can't speak. I'm too afraid to speak. Yet, but Yahweh wants to come in and release that so you can fly free. I'm dead. When we read these texts in Matthew, and we're going to read that next here just really quick, I can't get up. I'm lame. I can't walk. I'm a leper. I'm someone who goes ahead and speaks when I shouldn't speak, and I speak bad words. Do you get it? We're all sinners on one of these levels. Every one of us has a problem. We're either blind, deaf, dumb, dead, lame, or we're a leper. Or all of them. Okay? That's what I'm convinced of. I don't know about you. But that's what I say. Turn with me to Matthew 9. And then I'm going to have Aaron show you something that just rocked my world today. And I just want to share it with you. Matthew 9. Matthew 9, starting in verses 23. When Yeshua came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he began to say, depart, for the girl is not dead, but she's asleep. And they all laughed at him. Were they blind, deaf, dumb, or dead? All the above. But when the crowd had been pulled out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And this news went out into all the land. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And after he had come into the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes. So he touched their eyes, saying, Be it done to you according to your what? Faith And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See here, let no one know about this. Have you seen this before? But they went out, and they spread the news about him in that land. And as they were going out, behold, a dumb man, demon-possessed, was brought to him. And after the demon was cast out, the dumb man spoke, and the multitude marveled, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. If you've been healed by the Spirit... If you've been healed by the Spirit, my challenge to you is why aren't you telling somebody about it? Listen to me on this. If you have been healed by the Spirit, then why aren't you telling somebody about what the Spirit's done in your life? I guarantee you, if you've truly been healed by the Spirit, you cannot shut up. It'd be impossible. So I pray that you receive his spirit. I dream of the day when this congregation, this fellowship is so noisy outside that people just go, wow, I'm hearing the spirit in that place. You've been healed, let me know about it. How did the Lord touch your life? Let me know about it. Those are things the world needs to hear, not some long theological discussion. <laughs> I wanted to share this with you. It comes from an important, yeah, you'll, you'll know it. It's called the, the Chosen. And I want you to just see what happens. It's done in a song. It's just a little bit of a portion. And See if you can relate. Aaron, can that come up? A 
heard a story from the Bible When I was just a little girl About a broken hearted woman Who met the savior of the world Thought it was just another story what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Staring empty bottle I swear I caught a glimpse of him He met me right there at the bottom and turned that wine to living water and taught me how I've made mistakes. Too many. Where am I supposed to go when I need God? God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from. Oh, what you've done. It's no longer just a story when I read it. Cause I've seen him for myself and I believe. I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. Cause tonight. Yes, yes. If any of you are that earthen vessel that feels unclean, just know that he is the living water and can heal you. He can heal you. 
The other th important thing that I saw from this is that you couldn't shut her up. Every story that you've read in this week's Torah session has to do with people who could not shut up. Yeshua told them to be quiet and they couldn't. The cleansing that you see in Leviticus is not just some custom, it's not just some ritual, it's a prophetic promise. It's a prophetic promise. It's a prophetic promise to heal you. And that's shown through the Messiah and the spirit of the Ruach that's willing to come into your life. It, Brett was here and he spoke to you three weeks ago. I don't know what you, how you think. Brett's very happy with how the Lord has put him in a position to speak in Jewish synagogues and to present the gospel. And he asked us a question at the end of his, his teaching to us. And he says, how many of you are willing to stand up and say, Yeshua is my Lord and Savior? And not one did. When I thought it was one of the most powerful questions that ever could have been asked. We've got to get to that point. If you cannot give your testimony, then what are you doing? Why are we here? What good is this? If you can't give the testimony, what good is that? It's no good. We're playing church that doesn't belong here. You've got to give your testimony. If you are willing to leave here today and give that testimony, I ask you to stand with me right now and lift your hand up to the King of Kings and say, I'm giving it. I'm giving it. Amen. Amen. Father, you've seen these raised hands. Now I ask for you to give them strength that when they meet their neighbor and when they meet their friend, when they meet their child or their spouse, when they meet a loved one, that they give testimony. And Father, the other challenging thing I ask you to do is if they don't have a testimony, that you break them and knock them off their donkey as hard as you can and give them a testimony that they can speak words of life into themselves and to others. We praise your name, Father. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your spirit. And I bless it in complete holy name. Amen.